To call it a documentary doesn't quite cover it. The Cove is part action-adventure and part horror film. It's a story that begins with Rick O'Berry, the man who famously captured and trained the dolphins used in the Flipper TV show of the early 1960s. That series precipitated what's become a worldwide fascination with this intelligent, communicative, and smiling mammal. Soon after, dolphins were jumping through hoops at theme parks like sea- SeaWorld and Marineland and becoming a tourist draw. Today, dolphins can sell for up to $150,000 each, which brings us back to the film The Cove. The title refers to a location in Japan which has emerged as the site of the world's largest dolphin slaughter. Choice dolphins are picked out to sell internationally, and the rest are killed for their meat. Rick O'Berry joins forces with a team of diving, film, and gadget experts to infiltrate the heavily fortified cove in Taiji, Japan. His mission, and that of my next guest, was to covertly film the horrors that lie below sea level and expose the existence of the slaughter to the entire world. And if that doesn't sound very easy, it isn't. The cove is almost impenetrable. Security at the gate 24-7, guard dogs, barbed wire, and an entire town willing to do, it seems, almost anything to keep the cove a secret. Louis Sahoyas is the driving force behind this project and this film. He's the director of The Cove and before that, an award-winning photographer for Nat- National Geographic. And he joins me now live in Studio Q. Hello, sir. Hello. Good morning. Thank you. Very good to have you here. Well, nice to be here. Congrats on your uh, Hot Docs premiere in Canada last night. There was a uh, an eruption at the end of the film. Actually, there were cheers at points during the film, uh, and I might say probably tears as well. And then as the film ended, people literally jumped to their feet. Um, uh, Toronto audience is sometimes known for not being as animated as uh, as they are in other places, but they certainly were last night. It must have felt good on stage when you walked on, on stage. Uh, I was that. crying. I mean, it's like uh, I've never seen that kind of an, op- uh, of, a, of an audience of any film before. And... I don't know to to have a part in it really feels astounding. I mean, it's a it's a you know the director John Ford said that making a film is like painting a picture with an army, and I had a really good army with me. A lot of good Canadians, you know, the the world champion free divers that went into the lagoon with us, Mandy Ray Cruikshank, yeah. Kurt Croc, they helped us get into the lagoon. Uh, Simon Hutchins is you know used to work for the Canadian Air Force, and he designed a lot of the electronic gear. So you know we had a a, a good show of force from them last night as well. People see this as some uh, uh, an activist triumph. I want to get to that, but let me start where the film somewhat starts and where I started with the introduction, which is Flipper, the TV series. And, and something of a paradox, uh, Flipper, because ostensibly it was this show celebrating uh, the dolphin. We love the dolphin. We love Flipper. And yet uh, the man behind it, Rick O'Berry, behind training uh, these dolphins, uh, discovers... Uh, a few years in, that he is actually doing the dolphins a great disservice, and he be- this becomes a lifelong journey for him, as we discover in your film, to try and uh, uh, repent. It would seem. How much do you think this film is about his redemption? I think it it, it starts there and it ends up there. I mean, he said that uh, he told me that you know Flipper was the best and the worst thing that ever happened for dolphins. That it, you know it enlighten people that these animals are sentient and intelligent, but it also created all these captures that now everybody wants to, you know, swim with a dolphin or do dolphin therapy or do you see a dolphin show that makes it's a multi-billion dollar year industry. And once he realized that these animals shouldn't be in captivity, it was already too late. It was like, you know, now he's a, he says he's a a reformed dolphin trainer. He, uh, he's actually captures them from the, from captivity and puts them back into the wild. Should we feel guilty about uh, having enjoyed Flipper as kids? Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I certainly <laughs> did. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, you do now. I mean, that's mean. that's one of the reversals, I think, of this movie. It works on a lot of different levels. It's it's a uh, it's a story of Rick's personal quest for redemption, but it's also sort of mimics societies. I think. You talk about this a bit in the film, but dolphins are, are seen as intelligent and helpful to humans. Uh, they've almost been fetishized in popular culture and TV shows, films. What do you think lies at the heart of our fascination with these animals? Um, I think people that, are, that train dolphins, I think what they realize is that there is potentially a, a more intelligent species out there, that you don't have to go into outer space to find it. It might be right here on, you know, on our own planet. You know, dolphins have bigger brains than us. They have this extra sense. I mean, when you slow down those, they can they can talk and clicks and whistles at the same time. Hmm. They have, and when you start to slow them down, you see that there's what we just hear is one sound wave is actually hundreds, if not thousands, in one second. They're communicating volumes of information, most likely to each other, that we can't only comprehend as uh, uh, you know ignorant whistles, but it's not. So they're, they're they're highly intelligent animals. 
the dolphin slaughter in Taiji, Japan, uh, has been going on for, for years. Why does it happen? It happens because, well, several reasons. Uh, the Japanese government has been telling the dolphin hunters that the, that the dolphins are eating too many fish. You know, the, the, the oceans are collapsing, and we're starting to blame whales and dolphins for eating too many fish. That's their, that's their strategy at the IWC, the International Whaling Convention. They're trying to convince the international community that dolphins and whales are responsible for eating too many fish. That's one of their arguments. Mm. Um, and it's, a, it's seen as if they don't tell people that it's toxic, that the meat's toxic, then they can sell it for as fake whale meat. That's what's going on in the country. Uh, so it comes down to the profit margin. It is. It's, it's about money. Why do you think... I mean, you were the first people to be able to actually penetrate the Taiji and, and get even, even nobody's been, been able to even photograph this. Well, why do you think the Japanese government has been so successful at keeping this a secret? Um, because they, there's a media blackout on all stories involving whales and dolphins, and especially mercury. The, there's been a, you know, historically there's been covers up, covers up in the past with the Japanese and mercury. The biggest industrial accident of the first industrial accident of uh, mod in the modern era happened in Minamata where there's a big toxic waste dump of mercury that got infected a lot of people about 200,000 people in in Minamata and this is sort of mimicking that right now they just settled that case this has been going on for 50 years since mm. you know the 1950s and they just settled that case last year and I think they're worried about it starting again because all dolphins are toxic because they bioaccumulate heavy metals like mercury um, which is primarily through the comes comes at them through the burning of, of fossil fuels. It goes up, th it rises up the food chain, it bioaccumulates, and and so that animals at the top of the food chain, like humans and dolphins, collect this these, these toxins in the meat. And they dolphin meat is uh, well, it's in the movie. Rick's, uh, Roger Payne says these animals are swimming toxic dump sites. That's what it's come down to. The average bottlenose dolphin on the east coast of the United States has about 6,800 parts of PCBs in it. A toxic waste dump that has like 50, 50 parts per million. So these animals are basically refuges for, for all of the toxins that we're dumping into the environment. Where did this film begin for you? I mean, why was this an issue uh, and film important to risk your life over, let alone devote three years of your of your life to it? Well, little by little, I mean, you start to take one step at a time. You didn't um, know it was going to be three years. No, no, we had no idea. We had, you know, when I, when I first started this project, uh, I met Steven Spielberg. Our kids were doing sleepovers together. I don't have to go into all the details, but um, he came over to the boat I was staying on and said. Uh, he wanted to know about the father of, you know, the, the son that was sleeping over on, on his, at his place. And he says, what do you do for a living? And I had just started. This is my first film. I said, well, I'm, I'm, I'm a filmmaker. And he said, well, what, you know, what are you doing? And I told him I work running with the Oceanic Preservation Society. He said, well, let me tell you, never do a, a film using boats, animals, or children. <laughs> and Spielberg thought, said that. Yeah, yeah. Spielberg that told me that. So I thought, well, okay, now, now I go over to Japan, and the, my first subject is a secret cove that, people have been trying for 20 years to get into they can't get into it and it's guarded 24 7 by guards and police and guard dogs and it's you know tunnels that you have to get through it was like you know mission impossible get in I, I did everything wrong with this film but uh the reason i did it is because it's, a, it's an important story it needs to be told it was a you know what happens in the cove is sort of a metaphor of what's going on with the bigger oceans and you know once you see what happens there, you start to realize this is happening all over. You mentioned Spielberg, not n not a small name. We know mm -hmm. who, who he is. I mean, despite very much being an activist film, there's a dizzying array of video and sound gear. You had an entire film uh, team devoted to this project. You, you had a blimp. How did you get the financial resources to pull this off? Uh, Jim Clark the, is my, my dive buddy. He's a serial entrepreneur. He started Silicon Graphics, Netscape, and WebMD. Um, I think he just wanted to put something back in, you know, you, you know, he, he's very successful. And I think at the, you know, when you start to get people like, like him that have sort of gone through the gamut of their career moves and it's like, what's left. And you realize that, you know, the ocean was our, the one love that we shared and we were seeing it disappear before our eyes. We go back to these dive sites all over the world. And every time we went back, there was less fish. You'd see the legal fishing, you'd see dynamite fishing going on. We're destroying the oceans at this incredibly rapid rate, and he wanted to try to do something to stop it. And uh, he said, somebody should do something about it. And I said to him, well, how about you and I? So mm -hmm. we started the Oceanic Preservation Society, and 
this is our first film. Uh, on a macro level, I mean, this film is has already been very effective as an activist film, as a film that's going to create change. And I want to talk about documentaries and, and the role that they're playing in a, in a moment about that. But uh, in as much as it may be seen as a victory for activists or for a progressive community, it also... It does require a lot of resources. I mean, you, th- there's, it's clear that a lot of money had to go into what you did to pull this off. Uh, there's helicopters. There's a, a, you've, you've embedded cameras inside rocks. Do you think those kind of resources are necessary uh, to be able to pull off a kind of activist film that, that, uh, that, that, that you've accomplished here? Um, we could have done on a lot less money, I think, if I would have known what we were going to do it th- to begin with. But... Um you know, my, my theory is that if you're on the, on the correct path, the universe sort of supports you. I mean, I've, I, I'm using my own money. I'm using I have another, you know, billionaire friend that's helping us out with the prints and advertising. I think when, when you're on the right path, the resources come to you. It's just, you know, the, the money seems to fall out of the woodwork for me. You know, not just about <laughs> a money. lot of activists who, well, who the, would hope that you're right but haven't seen that kind of money. Um, it happens for them, too. I mean, Rick, you know, Rick has, has been, you know, when he started this, he's, he was broke. And the first time we screened it, you know, I raised eighty thousand dollars for him, and he, you know, and I had to get him out of bed to do it. I was like, you know, Rick, come on, we gotta, we gotta go to the screening. With there's only twelve people, but it's, you know, it's important. I think they might be helpful. Money's gonna come out of the woodwork for Rick. You know, it's, it's a. Uh, if you're on the right path, the universe supports you. I don't know what to say. I'm not like a spiritual of a guy, but this is it seems to work for me. What do you see as the role of the documentary and the changing role of the documentary now, uh-huh. Louis? Because this is, I mean, this film, uh, like I say, has already, as you as you, ex- you explained at the end of the film, has already created uh, a number of changes. And there's a piece today in, in one of the uh, Canadian papers about how um, documentaries like this aren't just enabling activism. They are the activism. The document, This documentary is the activism. If we all support it and, and, and follow what it's saying, what do you see the role as, as, of the doc as being? Well, I mean, I, I, listen, I, I love to be thrilled and entertained as the next guy, and I think this is, uh, you know, most documentaries feel like medicine when you're when you're watching them, and this one doesn't. I mean, it's it's from the first opening seconds you see that this is a thriller. We've we've tried to, you know, I, I'm, I come from a media background. I spent 35 years in the field working for National Geographic, doing some of the most popular stories in their history. I know how to craft a story. But in the, this case, we don't have time to make weak documentaries, documentaries that just sort of fill space and our entertainment. I mean, we have probably about two decades at the most to turn up to, to turn around what's going on in the ocean. So we don't have time to sort of fill the void with just bland entertainment. We don't need another. You know, I, I totally agree with your your reader the other day saying that uh, you know if you give people a challenging, interesting, entertaining, intelligent story, people will come. And, you know, last night there was lines around the corner of people waiting to get in. I mean, I really, truly believe that this is the kind of, you know, there's a, this is a, a new age of documentaries where, you know, people want to incite change. I mean, that's the point, you know, and we, tr- we try to do both sides of the story. We try to do it legally, but it didn't work out that way. In terms know? of the entertainment arc and the experience you say you've had with that, the James Bond quality of this film, if you will, how much of that was already embedded in this suspenseful story of you guys going there, and how much did you really try and make this an entertaining documentary? Well, I, I mean, to, to be quite honest, I, I really resisted putting our, ourselves into the story until the very end. You know, we, you know, we just needed to, we, we were shooting a making of documentary. And, and aside, this is going to be like a DVD extra. When we got back to the studio, the editor said, "Well, you know what." This stuff is ex- is as exciting as your story, and you know, because, and I go, we a lot of this was shot on night vision cameras and thermal cameras in the middle of the night with the you know the guards chasing us and stuff, and it, uh, when we looked at it back in the studio, it was like I started getting chills again. It's like oh, man, I was right living that, and it's like when you see it on the screen, in your own home, you know that's going to transfer over to an audience, and mm. you know, anyway, the the story got sort of morphed into like okay, let's put the deep, the making of. And make that part of the film, and I think that was a brilliant sort of tactic to make it, a, you know, entertainment. Let me ask you, as an artist, as a photographer, uh, how you walk the line with a film like this. This this is a, a beautiful looking film, despite the horror. Uh, this is almost an Edward Bertinsky kind of uh, uh, thought or question. How 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 do you reconcile the need to make something aesthetically compelling with the reality of the violence and the slaughter? Well, we, well, first of all, we started out wanting to make the most beautiful underwater documentary we could. Um, and what we came back with was a Citizen Kane of horror films and environmental films. And it, w- it didn't start out that way, but we did, it the f- we did 
this film the way old documentaries were, were made, where you, you actually go out and get the real story. We didn't storyboard this thing. It wasn't like, okay, we need to go out and make a thriller. How are we going to do it? Right. We went out there, and because of our passion for the subject, we actually came back with something that was ex incredibly real and wasn't invented or crafted by some you know, Hollywood writer. It was, it was just looking at the story and said, this is what happened. How can we tell this story? Hmm. And if anything, we sort of, you know, <laughs> we, we, uh, this is, the, you know, the, the, the scene at the end of the movie, we sort of made it the Disney version so people can watch it. But it's, uh, I mean, it's, it's beautiful and it's horrifying. Even the horror parts are beautiful. I mean, you know, I don't want to give away the, the, the story, mm -hmm. but I mean, it's like, it's like the, you know, the Zapruder film is like the Zapruder that, you know, the guy that filmed the Kennedy assassination, you know, that's 17 seconds. You look, you watch that and it's indelible. It's, you, it's forever in your, your head. The last 20 minutes of this movie, I feel like, are like that. Pretty powerful. But you don't fear um, either turning people off with how horrible it is or um, uh, making something aesthetically beautiful that is indeed uh, a terrible slaughter. Uh, I have no problems with the film the way it is right now. I think it's the most beautiful film you'll ever see on underwater life, and it's also the most horrific. Mm -hmm. But I think the horrific stuff is is worth seeing because it's it's actually done so sensitively. And the I don't know it's a it's a it's a fun. We 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 spent months walking that line trying to figure out are we going too far over and trying to you know make it so it was just you know watchable. <laughs> You talk about this being a, a metaphor for what's happening in our oceans. I'm, I'm sure many people around the world would argue that Canada's version of the dolphin slaughter is the annual seal hunt. That's some people's position, and this is once again uh, in the news. Why do you think exposing these hunting practices, say dolphins or seals, is so important to the environmental movement? Oh. <laughs> in I one mean, minute. Uh, Go, yeah, Louis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Describe World War II, use backside of paper if necessary. <laughs> it's, uh, uh, well... <laughs> I mean, we could have made this, you know, this this movie about snapper, but nobody cares about snapper. I mean, everybody, you know, dolphins and seals are the the large charismatic me megafauna. People care about them. You have you're sort of opening up a, a wellspring of people's built-in emotions when you start to discuss these subjects. Um, so it's metaphorically, it's a good subject matter, but it's also, I mean, seals. I mean, don't they sort of embody the innocence of nature mm. and what we're destroying? And dolphins, you have the most intelligent. You know, they have bigger brains than us. They're more sentient. They're more gregarious. They're more social. Uh, and if we're destroying that, I mean, that's a powerful symbol. And I didn't, you know, I didn't choose the symbol. It sort of chose me. But they're also cute. <laughs> and, I, and I'm sure the slaughter of almost any animal, uh, chickens or cattle, would seem barbaric if you made a film about that. It, so it's where do you draw the line between saving dolphins and other species? Well, we're the Oceanic Preservation Society, not the Chickens you, Preservation you Society. You pick your spots. <laughs> <laughs> I got you. Uh, are you? Uh, you're obviously uh, enjoying the the success of this documentary. Has have there been reprisals? Have you heard? Uh, are you are you worried about uh, uh, Japan or or anybody anybody else taking umbrage in a, in a legal way? Uh, uh, well, I, I have put gates around my house. <laughs> have you? Serious, oh, yeah. And uh, there's arrest warrants out for us in Japan, so we, we know that we're being effective. Not visiting Tokyo anytime soon. N yeah, yeah, exactly. It's, uh, I want to make sure you're not stopping there with, with transits that you didn't know about. Absolutely. Louis, thanks very much for coming in. Thanks for having Appreciate us. Appreciate it. Louis Sahoyas is the director of a new documentary called The Cove. He joined me live in Studio Q.